This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. You want to see political parties represented in municipal politics? We're just curious. That's where we're going on uh, today's show. You know, there, there's talk, there's rumblings of political parties forming in the, the the most intimate, the most immediate level of government at city council. Your city councilors are the ones that you, you, know, you run into at the grocery store. You feel okay approaching them at the farmer's market or at Folk Fest or while you're filling up your car with gas beside each other or, or locking up your bikes at the bike rack. City councilors are the ones that are dealing with their constituents on the everyday issues people that are unhappy with the barking dog next door or the the degree of snow clearing that is or is not happening on their property or their property taxes that in some alberta municipalities are jumping by up to 30 percent over the coming year why because there's issues on funding and sustainability and a lot of people a lot of everyday folks like you and i are quite frankly, unhappy with the structure of municipal government. They don't like that to get a handle or to get an understanding on where city councillors stand on an issue or or land on on a certain policy. It's not easy enough. They can't say, well, this is what the conservatives think or the liberals or the NDP or the Greens. City councillors are different. Right. You could argue that in a city like Calgary or Edmonton, you've got 12 completely or 13 completely different perspectives represented. Some argue that's a great thing. Some argue that that's part of the problem. So today we're going to get into this with Alberta's most recognized and easily most respected pollster, Janet Brown, out of Calgary, and the newly minted president of Alberta municipalities. He's the mayor of Wetaskiwin, his worship, Tyler Gandum. That's coming up in 30 seconds. But this episode wouldn't be happening without the support of our friends at Danatech. If you're in charge of safety training with your team and you're looking to get that team the industry's absolute best safety training, Danatech's been Alberta's safety training leader for more than 30 years. Their courses are designed by experts with real on-the-job experience. So that means the courses are going to actually make a difference on the job site. Why not save lost time injuries, stay compliant with changing regulations, and save money on training with Danatech? Big companies across Canada use Danatech's WIMIS, TDG, electrical, and lifting device courses for good reason. It's, well, they've got a catalog of over 150 courses across all industries, so it's an easy decision. And Danatech's all about making your life easier. Visit them online today at danatech.com to see their courses and to find out about those bulk discounts. As mentioned, Tyler Gandum has served uh, the residents of Wetaskiwin on council uh, as a councillor and uh, as mayor, different roles for the last 10 years or so. A funeral director by trade. He's also a captain with the local fire department. And he was elected president of Alberta municipalities at the end of September of this year. Janet Brown is Alberta's most recognized pollster and political analyst. She's got more than 30 years of experience in polling and market research, and she seems to have developed a knack for asking the right people the right questions. But Janet, that's that's a little bit of a that's a bit of a whimsical introduction. I prefer I think you'd probably prefer me to simply say that you're the one that's always closest when it comes to predicting the outcome of elections. That's kind of where you hang your hat, right? It's where I hang my hat, and thank you for mentioning that. Otherwise, I probably would have got it into the conversation myself. But, (laughs) you know, I'm proud proud to say in 2019, I was the only pollster that released a poll during the 2019 provincial election that was within the margin of error. And the polling industry did a lot better in 2023. There were several pollsters within the margin of error, but still I was at the top of the list. So I I predicted that uh, the UCP would get 52% and the NDP would get 42%. 44%. Turns out the UCP got 
six. So wow. the, that darn point six is is my no. But Janet, pe- pe- people people would start getting suspicious if you were too close. People oh. would start wondering if the books were cooked. So it, it, it's all right to be there. The reason why I want to establish this, and, and and not just to extend a warm welcome to the both of you, but also we're going to be getting into polling today. And you know, a lot of times people will say, "Ah, that's polling. Nobody nobody cares. Nobody pays attention to polling. That you know, pollsters are always you know, pollsters are like weather forecasters. No offense to weather forecasters nor pollsters, but I want to establish that your methodology has proven itself to be consistent and accurate. Yes, and I do my polling differently than other pollsters. So, so number one, I specialize on, in Alberta politics. Occasionally, I'll venture in and talk about um, national stuff, but I, I know my lane. I stick to it, and that's Alberta politics. And what I know is that traditional polling methods don't always work as well in Alberta as they do in other parts of Canada. So most of the polls you hear about are done online, or, or perhaps okay. they're done through a robo call. A computer calls you up, press one for this, press two for that, and Pollsters do a decent job with those methodologies, but I use a true random sample. We contact people at random using live telephone interviewers. Those interviewers are based in Edmonton. So I say my secret sauce is Albertans calling Albertans. And when we get somebody on the phone who is you know, willing to participate, we give them a couple options. You can answer it now, you can answer it online. So, so basically I think that the magic of our methodology is like I said, Albertans talking to Albertans. Um, making it as easy as possible for people to answer uh, my surveys. And I don't do overnight surveys. I will call somebody five times before I give up on them. Um, you know, we're trying to get a really high response rate. So that's that's the the methodology I use. It's, it's, it's different from other pollsters. It's, you know, sadly more expensive, but I, I think it gives you the outcome. Uh, well, it's it, it's proven to be accurate in the last couple of elections. I mean, sadly or not, more expensive depending on your perspective. If if you're the one sending mm-hmm. the invoices, that's not sad. That's fantastic. Good for you. <laughs> you found a way to make a great living doing this. Uh, hey, Mayor well, Gandalf. Well, no, no, it's expensive because I've got overhead. Don't make me don't make me sound greedy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not greedy. You're just solid at what you do. You're the best at what you do. Johnny and I were talking off camera before about Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl. If you're the best at what you do, you deserve to be paid the best. Maybe we'll talk Oilers later in the show, but we're not looking to bring dark clouds over this conversation okay, right okay. now necessarily. Please, 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 though. It's high overhead. It's not great. Yeah, there, there you go. Yeah. We've established that. <laughs> Mayor, it's so nice to see your face. Uh, last time you and I connected, you were here in studio and, and you were heading into uh, that, uh, I mean, that, that weekend where you were hoping to walk away as president of Alberta Municipalities. Indeed, uh, you achieved that goal. So congratulations. What's the first, you know, five weeks or so been like uh, steering that ship? Morning, Ryan. It's been really good. Um, I had a really good idea of what I was getting into uh, when I was running for president, being close with Barry Morishida and both Kathy Heron. So knowing what to expect helps a lot. And the amazing staff with Alberta Municipality sure makes it a whole lot easier to navigate my new schedule and expectations. Cool. Well, we'll we'll talk uh, about your tenure and some of your goals and and top priorities through the course of of this panel conversation. I'm grateful that both of you are here. But but why don't we cut right to the chase, uh, Tyler? Do you have a strong position? I'm asking you personally. Do you have a strong position either way about wh- whether or not Albertans would be better served if political parties were represented in municipal politics? I'm having a hard time understanding why that would even come into play in terms of the infrastructure we're putting into the municipality, whether potholes are getting filled, which roads are being fixed, if we're going to build a new rec center, if we've got a new arena coming in. I don't feel that your political stripe or the pajamas you wear, the color of the pajamas you wear really matters on those municipal issues. And I think that some of the reasons we've heard in terms of the ability to um, fundraise or higher voter turnout for a municipal election is the cause or is the reason that they're looking into it and i just i think there's far better ways to increase municipal engagement besides turning it into another political party um, fight and i think i've seen over the years a high voter turnout in some municipalities and uh, a low voter turnout and it comes down to the the people running in it and whether or not there's some friction between them. And I think that that's what's drawing a higher voter turnout versus uh, whether or not you are conservative or not. 
Yeah, I was I was talking to a guy over the weekend, and I'm not going. You know, he he's not announced anything, and nothing's been made public, so it's it's not up to me to spill the beans here. But but there are things happening, and I'm sure that maybe they're happening across the province. But it's the worst kept secret in Edmonton um, that a group, a motivated group with deep pockets, is working to prepare itself uh, for the possibility of uh, you know uh, the provincial government making changes here to the local authorities election act which would introduce political parties at the municipal level um whether or not that happens and and you know i'm curious for both of your takes on this uh most people are suggesting this is not a priority of the provincial government at least not right now that the window on this might be over the next three to six years but this group wants to be ready and if there's not an official political party represented then they'll run a slate like they do in vancouver uh, that that gives voters essentially an, an option to say, look, all their lawn signs are the same color. All of their top priorities are the same. They're essentially running on a platform. So if, if you don't want 12 different perspectives at City Hall and you want one, uh, then this is the way to go. Um, Tyler, do you see that happening uh, across the province? Is, is, is it happening outside of Edmonton? I mean, how much of an actual issue is this? It happens every once in a while. And in my experience, it hasn't been successful. I think when you're getting into a municipal election, what's important is the person that's representing you and not necessarily who they align with. Um, Saying that you're going to keep taxes at a 0% increase or you're promising something in terms of a rec center or an arena like I was talking about, um, sometimes plays with the voters and sometimes it doesn't. So I don't think it matters on who who you're running with because I haven't seen a, a full slate Uh, get elected in a municipality and I'm sure it's happened I just haven't seen it so I don't see it being anybody's advantage to to run that way so Janet you can can you take us into your process on on uh, speaking to close to a thousand Albertans and and getting a sense of where they land on this even sort of you know who you talk to generally speaking what pockets of the province the questions you ask them let's let's dig in here Okay, well, uh, I'll just start by saying I used exactly the same methodology for this project as I did to predict the outcome of the election. Okay. So it's, it's what I described earlier. It's we contact people uh, at random. So we just dial telephone numbers at random, both landlines and cell phones. Um, and then when we get people on the line, we give them the option. You can answer it now. I'll call you back at, a, at another time. Um, another really important thing with my surveys is we do try and keep the length under control because really long surveys tend to be less reliable than short surveys. So, so this was a short survey, and there were, I mean, there were a couple of questions devoted um, just to municipal parties. So we asked, and, and in terms of like who we're talking to, um, we set quotas to make sure that the sample is representative in terms of region, age, and gender. Um, and then we monitor a lot of other things like um, like uh, education levels, income, that sort of thing. So we're trying to uh, produce a very representative sample. Now we asked the question, we said, when it comes to municipal politics, um, would you rather candidates run as individuals or run as representatives of political parties? And 68%, more than two thirds of people told us they would prefer if municipal candidates continued to run as individuals. Only 24% wanted them to be part of a political party, and 9% were just a little unsure and couldn't give us an answer there. Um, Then we went on to sort of probe why people were giving the answers that they were giving. And and we presented a few ideas to people and asked them to agree or disagree with them. Now, when you look at that subset of people who want the system to stay the same, want candidates to still represent themselves as individuals, you know, the top reason they gave for that is because they're worried that if you're elected as part of a slate, you're going to be motivated to vote according to party lines and not necessarily what's best for your uh, representative. So among those people who want to keep the system the same, 92% of them say we risk having um, our municipal candidates vote according to the best interests of um their party rather than constituents. And then the next reason they give is they feel that politics is going to become more divisive and less effective if there's political parties at the municipal level. Uh. Now, those who now those who like political parties at the municipal level, um, their main reason is they just think it'll be easier to understand where a candidate stands if yeah. they're part of a slate. And that's one of the challenges in a municipal election is trying to figure out, you know, where where candidates stand. So parties would just be a good shorthand for where somebody stands. And and the people who like it 
they think that it will make those candidates more accountable if there's a political party. Yeah, I the, the accountable thing. Yeah, the divisiveness. Absolutely. I mean, that's that's kind of I don't want to say that's what characterizes the other two levels of government, Tyler. But but for the most part, it is. Like, you know, we, we look at, uh, I, I can think of examples off the top of my head. I, I think that, um, you know, a, a tragic situation, you know, when, when uh, RCMP Constable Wynn was shot outside the Apex Casino in St. Albert and the conservatives, I think originally under, at that time, Brent Rathgaber, the MP out of St. Albert, uh, came up with the so-called Wynn's Law uh, and the liberals voted it down with their majority government, even though I think most people agreed. And, and, and I remember at that time, Minister Amarjeet Sohi telling me on my previous radio show that it was still a priority for the liberals and they were going to do something about it and make changes to bail. But 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 not that. And you kind of got the sense it was because it was a private member's bill, because it was a conservative bill. Same thing with member former MLA Lori Blakeman. Uh, remember the, the, the private member's bill? I think it was 210 ended up becoming Bill 10, which was one of the things that started the avalanche that took down the Jim Prentice conservatives in 2015. Why didn't that pass? Probably because Lori Blakeman was a liberal MLA and not a conservative. I mean, we see examples of this all the time where we can see good ideas in politics, but they don't happen because they're not ideas from the government. Right, Tyler? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that if there's a lot more, um, I think if they're able to work together and not decide that it's because of which political party it came from, a good idea is a good idea. It doesn't matter. Yeah. I, hmm. Janet, I think I'm probably one of the nine percent that's undecided on this but i think if i had to, if, if if you forced me to say yes or no right now i might say no can we get into what those with a post graduate education or, or at least post-secondary education like how that translates into it the more educated voters lean pretty strongly in a certain direction right and the more educated voters sort of lean towards the status quo and mm -hmm. and you know the less well-educated um, and, and, and also we sort of see a, a left right split on this, right? Like it's, you know, the higher your education, the more likely you are to be a left wing voter, the uh, that that sort of thing. And so I, I think what this is coming from is the fact that, you know, here in Alberta, you know, over the last 52 years, we only had four years where we weren't governed by a conservative party. Um, the conservatives do really well at the federal level here in Alberta. But conservatives struggle to get elected at the municipal level. So, you know, look at the two big cities. Um, the the candidates that were sort of positioning themselves as a conservative option in both Edmonton and Calgary um, lost the last uh, election. And uh, Tyler can speak to sort of how that played out in some of the smaller municipalities. So, you know, clearly what's driving this, you've got Take Back Alberta talking about how they want to focus on school board elections and that sort of thing. This movement is really coming out of the conservative side of the ledger. And that's just because of their ongoing frustration. Why can we win at the provincial and the federal level, but we can't seem to win at the municipal level? And a lot of them are thinking, you know, parties may give them that advantage. Do you have do you have a, a gut instinct as to why that is, Janet? Oh, why they why they can't win? Yeah, like, and, um, and let me just for 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 context, let me throw one other thing into the mix. Uh, when I talked to Take Back Alberta founder David Parker, I guess maybe about a month ago ish, people can check our archives. I suspected that this is right in his wheelhouse, and I wouldn't rule it out. Uh, but he seemed to indicate that this wasn't something they were interested in; that they're more interested in populating the school boards. But uh, why do you think that is? Well, so w this question was about municipal elections. And don't forget, school board trustees are elected yeah. um, in the municipal election process. So, you know, when we asked this question, um, you know, I, I think we even set up the, you know, we, we set up the premise that municipal elections include both school boards and um, and municipal councils. So, um, you know, why do I think that conservatives have a hard time winning at the, at the local level? Well, I, I think my theory for that is, as you get closer to home, the left-right continuum kind of means less and less in your mind when you're a voter, right? So here in Alberta, we've got this strong history of electing conservatives at a provincial level. We have an even stronger history of voting conservatives at a federal level, right? The further you get away from home, you know, the, the easier it is to vote for a conservative party. The closer you get to home, and it's like Tyler said, you know, when you ask people what the most important municipal issues are, 
they talk about infrastructure, they talk about parking, they talk about rec facilities. And the closer you get to home, I, I think the less likely you are to, you know, apply a, a fiscally conservative lens to municipal issues. So, so I think that's one of the reasons that, you know, right wing candidates just don't do as well at the municipal level because because the issues people are considering are different at the municipal level. Uh, Janet, don't roll your eyes at this. I'm not comparing, not even in the <laughs> same encyclopedia, let alone on the same page, what you do to an unofficial, unscientific Twitter poll. But I'm just going to let people know right now. Uh, and you're going, is he seriously going to quote a Twitter poll? But this is just, <laughs> I just, just out of curiosity, I threw this up eight minutes ago. We've already got over a hundred votes. I'm just asking people uh, at Ryan Jesperson, if you follow me on Twitter, would you like to see political parties represented at the municipal level in Alberta? Uh, oh, now 124 votes. It just jumped. 83% are saying no. Uh, 13% are saying yes. And about 4% are saying they're undecided. Just curious. Would you, how different would you expect something like an unscientific, unofficial Twitter poll to differ from your results and obviously a top shelf professional polling structure? Okay. So, so one of the things sort of about my methodology that's different than online panels, and I said off the top, I'm really becoming preoccupied with keeping my uh, surveys as short and simple as possible um, because there's a certain voter, there's a certain type of voter that's not as likely to participate in surveys. And so, um, you know, a thank you, everybody who weighed in on this. I think it's great to, you know, put your opinion out there. Um, but there's also people uh, who are driving in their cars right now, and they can't take their hands off the wheel to enter this poll, right? So the kind of people you miss when you do these non random polls is, is you miss the um, you miss the, the the you miss the people who are out there working, who are who are preoccupied. And so the voter I'm always concerned about that we miss in polling is the person with a high school education or less, the person who 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 works a, a job that doesn't have them sitting in front of the computer, um, you know, that sort of thing. So your numbers actually kind of um, those numbers you just showed me actually align pretty closely with our highly educated subsample. Well, wow, that's um, our audience, right? Janet. Our highly educated subsample. So your audience probably represents part of my sample, but there's another part of the sample that's, um, uh, you know, that that is there's actually sort of taking somebody's pulse in an emergency room right now who's uh, right. not man answering the poll. For sure. We'll leave this up for 24 hours. Most people yeah. are going to hear this show later in the day this evening when they're walking their dogs. Uh, so I encourage you to chime in on that. I'd, I'd love to see 1,500 to 2,000 votes on this and just get a sense. Again, Janet's polling is way more serious, <laughs> way more serious and, and more significant. Tyler, I mean, representing Alberta municipalities here, and I think most people are, are familiar with the group, but if not, people can always check them out online at abmunis.ca to, to get a sense of the mandate of Alberta municipalities and what the group does and, and how it supports Alberta's communities. Uh, but there was a mandate letter from the Premier, we should get into this, to, to Rick McIver, the Honorable Rick McIver, Minister of Municipal Affairs, to look into the Act. Now, it didn't spell out these changes, but... Some folks I know do believe that that's exactly the point of that, that that's kind of what these instructions are, are leading to. What are you reading into that mandate letter? And, and where do you I mean, I, I guess I'm asking you to speculate a little bit uh, to the degree where you're comfortable. But but where do you think this is going? What do you think the provincial government might do? And if you feel really sassy, maybe throw, maybe include a timeline in that. Uh, I, I think it it helps. It helps our position on it because Minister McIver came from municipal background. Um, I'm not sure that uh, this is totally speculation and, and putting words in his mouth, but I don't know that his time as a Calgary councillor would show that you needed to have party politics involved in municipal elections to, to change anything. I think he worked with enough members of his council um, that were all varied in their opinions and, and their beliefs. And when it came down to it, what it was about was making Calgary a better place. And I think that that's what most people who run for council in their municipalities is going for. They want to make their home better. And if I were to put a timeline on this, I think that they would get enough pushback over the next six, eight months that this isn't going to be something that they pursue for 2025. Maybe they wait and see what 2025's municipal election looks like and 
and then they make a decision. But I don't see a real need for anything to happen within the next two years. Uh, we're just under two years away from the next election. But but let's not forget, in 2010, Rick McIver ran for mayor of Calgary, um, a very well-known uh, member of council who was seen as Dr. No. He was seen as the very conservative candidate. And he seemed like the shoe in to win the mayoralty election in 2010. And he lost to a guy named Nahed Nenshi who had purple campaign signs. Right. So so Rick McIver actually is a good example of a conservative that looks poised for victory at the municipal level and comes up short. So you've got I mean, yeah, the, and, and that is significant, Janet, and that is a contributing factor. Now, you're you're a pollster, but you're also an analyst. Uh, so what sort of thing might happen when, when Mayor Gandam here is talking about he says, well, we maybe not in time for 2025, kind of see how it goes, see what happens. Can, can you give us a, a couple examples, Janet, of, of, of things that may happen, not to an individual? I mean, I guess, although. Let me take that back because McIver had a big team behind him and obviously a lot of money behind him, a lot of supporters. So it's not necessarily an individual that got burned in that election. But but what would happen bigger picture, do you think, to turn the tide uh, that may create a more favorable landscape for legislation like this to happen? In other words, for political parties to infiltrate municipal politics. Can can you see a scenario where that becomes more of a popular idea? Um. No, I, I like I look at this this polling that I did and uh, public opinion is pretty firm against this idea. Um, but, you know, does that mean that it does it, it's it, just because most people in the public doesn't want it? Does that mean that it's not going to get implemented? So I'm not going to predict whether or not this provincial government's going to act here because, you know, there's a few ideas out there in the public ether right now that that don't do well in polling, but the government's still pushing them anyway. So I'm thinking about a provincial pension plan, for instance, right? So um, so, so there, there's public opinion, and then there's what government does with it. Um, so, but I, I think in the terms of like, you know, the issue of legislation, um, you know, I think government can consider bringing some legislation in. And, and one maybe, um, favorable reason for trying to legislate around this is because it may happen whether there's legislation or not. Slates of candidates may just evolve in an informal way. Um, you know, we saw this in the last election that, you know, uh, well, another example I was thinking of is uh, Jeremy Farkas. Back, back in 2017, he, he ran for mayor in um, 2021, but but was defeated by Jody Gondek. But when he was first elected to city council in 2017, he was a, a he was a, a, a needle fight. He wasn't well known by his constituents, but he had dark blue lawn signs and he established himself as the conservative candidate and, and, and won there. So um, so so we have this history where people are already piggybacking with parties. Multiple candidates are standing at a podium together, forming alliances. Unions are backing certain candidates. So Although the public doesn't want to see this, I think maybe government may say, look, this is going to happen organically. So we should have some rules in place so it's not too much of the wild, wild west. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I wanted to get to some of the comments here. Like, you know, uh, Alberta Girl says Take Back Alberta is attracting members by telling them that voters have been ignored by party politicians. And they're not wrong on that point, says Alberta Girl. Uh, we've got some other interesting takes on this. Um, Kathy says, I've seen our municipal government split votes on almost exactly the same way on, on everything, no matter what it was. It, it, it's already happening without political parties. I saw somebody else make the comment that says you, you can already basically tell the political leanings of councillors or of a council uh, based on their top priorities, which isn't wrong. Right, Tyler? I mean, it, it's difficult to just pigeonhole people or put them in a box. But but like Janet alluded to, um, you know, Edmonton's council is pretty obvious. It's not a, a UCP driven council. Like that's just pretty obvious. Anybody that pays attention for more than 10 seconds can already figure that out. I, I think because a municipality is also now having to deal with social needs in their communities, mm. I don't think that that necessarily means that you're left leaning or don't align with the conservative party. I think that what we're being forced to look after right now in terms of healthcare and social needs, with Taswin's a great example of the mental health and addictions that we're struggling with right now. Just because that's a focus that I have that I think is going to make my community better doesn't mean that I'm left leaning in terms of my political stripe it's something that i'm forced to deal with and it's got nothing to do with my political alignment 
Yeah, there's a good comment here from Tara Lynn as well, who says, I want different perspectives. I want my counselors to have to think and to have the expectation there that there will be a, that they will be solution focused with diversity and collaboration. Janet, I can tell that's resonating with you. Yeah. So, it, you know, in addition to doing polling, I do a lot of focus groups. Right. And mm. you just sort of bring, you know, eight or nine people together. We do them on Zoom now post pandemic. And one of the funnest things for me in a focus group is when someone in the focus group hears something they never heard before and they go, hmm. That gives me a different perspective, right? Clients say to me, I don't like focus groups. People change their minds. And I said, that's what I like about focus groups. I like to see people hearing something new and it and it changing the way that they think. And so I think that's one of the beauties of a municipal council is, yeah, 80% of the time their vote may be totally predictable, but it's always really interesting to see when that, you know, that one councillor um, steps out and does something different. Um, you know, I'm here in Calgary. It's also really interesting to see those rare occasions where everyone on council is in alignment, right? It's um, and those are things that only happen at the municipal level. Um, you know, where people sort of you know break their patterns and vote outside of their usual pattern, or when an entire council can come together and vote for something unanimously. It, how does somebody get onto a focus group? Like if there's, if there, you, you know, that there, this audience is, I would say it's the most based on the evidence I've seen it on a 20 year career. This is the most engaged audience I've ever worked for. Um, and I guarantee there are people that listen to or watch real talk that would love to participate in the stuff you do. Can people apply? Is it random selection? How does that go? Okay. So I'm going to give a plug for trend research. So okay. I'm, I'm just independent. I'm self-employed. Um, but I outsource my field work to Trend Research in Edmonton. It's a it's a it's a, it's a small Alberta based company that that employs Albertans. So um, you know, plug to Trend Research uh, if you want to be part of focus groups. Get on their website. I think there's a place where you can. Oh, there you got it up there already. Um, you can you can get on their focus groups. The other thing is is um, you know we don't want the focus groups to become too self selected, right? You right. know, people start pouring in, uh, you know, uh, the applications to be part of focus groups, we could get a bias there. So I should say that these random surveys that we do every month, we do something called an omnibus survey, where people can buy one or two questions on that survey. And the last question on the survey is, would you like to join? Uh, would you like to be part of our focus group panel? Would you like to be part of our, our online panel? So most of the people who end up in our focus groups, the reason they ended up there was because they participated in a quantitative survey and then agreed to get calls about uh, qualitative surveys. And I'll give another plug to a client. Of course, I do a lot of research for CBC Calgary, and usually we do a combination of quantitative and qualitative. And that's what happens there. People who answer the quantitative survey about Alberta politics are invited to participate in more in-depth follow-up research. And then we recruit kind of a representative subsample of people to be part of the qualitative. Dwayne, uh, who's watching us live on YouTube right now, wins the dad joke of the day. He says, well, how do you get a focus group? Get a bunch of photographers together. <laughs> blah, blah. All right, Dwayne. <laughs> hey, can I keep you both for 10 more minutes? Sure. Okay, hang tight. We're talking to the president of Alberta Municipalities. Uh, he's the mayor of Wetasco and Tyler Gandam. And we're talking to renowned pollster Janet Brown. Uh, you may be listening to Real Talk Live on the Mixler audio app uh, presented by California Closets or watching us live on YouTube. Maybe you're catching it later and we sure appreciate it. Uh, Want to let you know right now that if you're looking for a new career in business, you're looking to kickstart opportunity and take advantage of a dynamic job market. If you're dreaming of leading teams and making a real impact in the world, or, or maybe you just look for an education at this point that leads to a fulfilling career in thriving and growing industries, I bet you that Nate's J.R. Shaw School of Business is your answer. It's one of Canada's leading polytechnic, polytechnic business educators, and they're specialists in harnessing your inner talent, building your skills, feeding your curiosity. Your future will be brighter because of their immersive style of learning and deep relationships with industry. Graduate with the in-demand skills that future employers are looking for. You have talent. They have connections. You have drive. They have direction. You have purpose. They can apply it. Get down to business today with Nate's J.R. Shaw School of Business at nate.ca business. 
Our friends at Kubi Renewable Energy are putting out the call right now. Their ever-expanding team, more than 110 of them now, if you can believe it, is in search of talented individuals to help Western Canada remain a leader on the renewable energy front. You know, more solar panels were install- installed in Alberta last year than anywhere else in Canada by a mile. If you're seeking a new horizon in your electrical career, Join Kubi and make an impact as a solar installer. At their company, your skills are cherished and they'll provide you with comprehensive solar training for a seamless shift. Get ready to master solar system installations and shine with Kubi Renewable Energy. You can learn more by checking out the careers link at kubienergy.ca. You know, my wife, Carrie Skelton, if you follow her on Instagram, you already know this, revealed our backyard makeover last week on her Instagram Reels. Check this out. We were, uh, quite frankly, mortified with the way that our backyard looked ever since we moved into the house. And so we went to the team at Eden Landscaping and, and asked them to do a complete overhaul. And that's exactly what they did. They brought in their equipment. They got rid of those chipped old bricks that had weeds growing up everywhere. The grass that just wouldn't grow. We had huge drainage issues flooding in the backyard every single time it rained. Can you imagine that with two 85-pound dogs? What Eden did has completely changed our backyard experience and we're thrilled at the opportunity to actually be proud to host people in our home space. They can do the same for you and you can find them online today by visiting landscapeedmonton.ca. And before we get back to Janet and Tyler, I wanted to remind you that this studio that we work in every single day was built with pride by the talented team at Complete Care Restoration. They're a full-service disaster restoration contractor, which means that they can help you after those gut punch situations, fire, flood. Maybe you've discovered mold or asbestos as part of what you thought was going to be a small and quick renovation project. They were founded in Edmonton more than 10 years ago. They started in a garage, a family-owned business, and they've grown from there. What that means is that you are getting people that treat your project like it's their very own. And we're not BSing you. Johnny and I have seen it firsthand. That's why we, without hesitation, for any construction or renovation project, recommend the team at Complete Care Restoration. We're talking to Janet Brown and Tyler Gandum. Janet, you know a pollster and political analyst, Tyler, the mayor of Wetaskiwin and the newly minted president of Alberta Municipalities. Uh, Janet, we'll get you to comment in just a minute on maybe some of the dynamics of of what's happening now uh, when it comes to funding for municipalities and that relationship with the province. I can't help but notice, Tyler, that as we're talking about whether or not people want to see political parties in municipal politics, the most recurring comment in our live chat has to do with funding stuff like infrastructure funding the fact that municipalities can't run deficits they operate under a different fiscal framework and i know that you can probably make it clear to our audience that this is alberta municipality's top priority right now i mean it's evident in the work that you're doing with the province tyler i think we have you on mute bud i just want to make sure that we can see you or hear you i should say try it again there we go you're back now there you go yeah no one of the, uh, actually the first question I asked the premier when I was elected president at our convention was the need for another billion dollars in the base funding for the new LGFF that's coming out, local government fiscal framework. Um, and that's that's number one. Across Alberta, we're running a $30 billion infrastructure deficit. Um, the, the cuts to, to funding, especially in infrastructure uh, since 2010 is almost, it's a little over two and a half times what we were getting in 2010 is what we've been cut now. Uh, per resident. So it's a big focus for us, definitely. The province has a a campaign going on right now, Alberta is calling, and they're trying to attract more people to move into the province, which is fantastic, because we we want our communities to grow as well. But we can't do that without that infrastructure funding to make sure that we've got the amenities, that we're attractive to the people looking for a new home coming from outside Alberta, to find our communities attractive and it's going to take a lot of money and it's going to take some funding from the provincial government. And that's definitely one of our priorities. Yeah. I was talking to a politician who who made the comment to me off the record. So I won't say who it was, but, but they were lamenting the fact that the Alberta is calling campaign. People can see it online at Alberta is uh, that it's been actually a little bit too successful uh, that it's creating problems. Tyler, would you agree? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're looking at while well, you spoke about it earlier, the the need to increase property taxes by double digit because they're growing so fast and they they just can't keep up. We're not, we're having a hard time finding trades. We're having a f- hard time with the supplies to make sure that all of that infrastructure can go in so that we're ready for um, for that big campaign and making sure that our communities are healthy and thriving and and growing well. Janet, when you're talking to focus groups and when you're chatting with people about, you know, the, the, their political priorities or, or what resonates with them, et cetera, et cetera, um, is infrastructure funding something that's on people's radar? I mean, a lot of times we're talking about like sewers and, and bridge repair and stuff that maybe unless you have a huge pothole in front of your house, it might not be forefront in your mind. Well, and one of the reasons that infrastructure gets overlooked a lot is because when you ask the question, what are the most important issues facing the province? Today, you're going to get answers like inflation, health care, education. Then when you say, what are the most important issues facing your municipality? That's when people are going to mention infrastructure. So, so when it doesn't come up in the first question, then people assume it's not important. But infrastructure is in so many of those other categories that people give us, right? Inflation is a big deal because these infrastructure programs um, they really get sidetracked when, you know, inflation drives the, the costs up. When people are talking about healthcare and education, they're often talking about a lack of facilities. Um, and then, at the you know, when you ask people about municipal politics, they in, in, immediately go to, you know, roads and sewers and rec facilities and that sort of thing. So I think um, concern about infrastructure is always there. But sometimes when, the, depending on how you ask the question, the importance of infrastructure doesn't always um, come through. But when you scratch the surface, um, you know, when I do a focus, it's, it's funny, I do a focus group and people think they're there to talk about Trudeau. And then I'd say, no, you're not here to talk about Trudeau. They think they're there to talk about provincial politics. No, we're here to talk about your municipality. And then they can just launch right into, um, look, this is what I see every day when I pull out of my driveway. Hey, but but correct me if I'm wrong. If I know my fellow Albertans, they can find a way to talk about Trudeau in any context. People still find a way to talk about Trudeau, don't they? Well, 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 sometimes and uh, this is maybe taking away from the, the representatives of my sampling. But sometimes, you know, focus group respondents are recognizing me as somebody who works in politics. Right. So so when I'm doing a focus group that's not po- directly political, I, I somehow just, I just have to give them all five minutes to, off the top. Yes. <laughs> just, like, <laughs> I have to give them five minutes off the top to, to, just to, to vent about Trudeau. And then it's like, OK, great. Can we now, um, you know, can we now talk about rec facilities? Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. That's, see, yeah. <laughs> this is why you're top of the class, Janet. That's exactly why. Uh, Tyler, I, I, I want to, again, give a shout out to the Alberta Municipalities website because in, in doing some background on this the resources there are incredible people should check out abmunis.ca but i know that for the average person we we can get you know sort of a wash in the big numbers right you say we have like a 30 to 40 billion dollar infrastructure deficit or or we've talked about oil and gas liabilities orphan wells and people's heads start to spin with the big numbers but when we boil it down to a per albertan number then it's easier to process right and i was blown away to see that the provincial government spending on infrastructure 10 years ago has dropped from 3.7% of the government's total spending to 1% today from 37 to 1% over the last 10 years. That is a drop from about $420 per Albertan to 150 from 420 to 150 in 2023. I mean, that is, uh, I don't know if you, I mean, the word indefensible comes to mind, most especially when we recognize that a lot of our infrastructure is crumbling and we're talking about keeping up to a population of 5 million, not where it's forecasted to be 25 years from now, which is double. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons that we're making that big push for that base funding increase. Uh, We're looking at about, we should have about $1.3 billion more coming in that LGFF funding formula uh, based on 2010 numbers with inflation. So we're definitely way behind. And one of the things that our residents don't understand is that when we get um, downloading or cuts from provincial funding, our residents don't care. They want to maintain that same level of service. They want to make sure that their roads are paved, their sidewalks look good, the potholes are filled. We've got um, recreation. We've got the amenities that they need to make sure that their their homes and their communities are where they want to live. 
But when you make cuts like that for infrastructure for a community, it makes it really hard without increasing property taxes. Some of these municipalities are, are seeing a double digit property tax increase. And a big part of that is, is the cuts from funding from other orders of government. And it's, it's frustrating. It's hard to, to explain or break down and, and showing just a simple, um, funding deficit that we're seeing now from 420 down to 150 per resident might resonate a little bit better than it's going to cost a million dollars to, to repave this road, or it's going to cost us, uh, $2 million this winter to look after snow clearing. And that's not even taking into consideration what the 50 year old arena is needing for repairs. We've got a new ish pool. It was built the year I was first elected in 2010. So 2011, it was finished. And just the maintenance and the upkeep that we need to have on that to make sure that we've got a, a great pool, a great recreation center for people to go to. All of those things cost money. And if we're getting cuts from the provincial government and the federal government, for that matter, uh, it makes it really hard to do without increasing those property taxes. It's uh, somebody pointed this out to me just last week. And, um, you know, I think that everybody, when you look at your community, most especially if you're in the big cities, you have at least one rec center arena or pool with the word centennial in its name. Right. There was a huge glut of ca- big federal expenditure back in 1967 that built a ton of rec facilities. And this person was quite rightfully pointing. I, I hadn't thought of it. Janet, you talked about it in focus groups when somebody has that like aha moment. And when they talked about the centennial rec facilities and they go, and listen, all of these are built with like a 50 to 60 year lifespan. Well, we're 55 years past that build right now, right? So, I mean, think of how much infrastructure is there uh, ready to be rebuilt or reinvested in. It it really is significant. Um, I want to thank both of you for your time. We kept you a little bit longer than we expected, but there was a lot to get to. I don't want to leave anything on the table. In the context of a closing remark or something to think about, Janet, have we missed anything important? Uh, no, I was just, uh, I just wanted to say, you know, the, the impetus to this whole research was I was a, a, a part of a political panel at an Alberta municipalities conference in, in March. And, and, and I was asked to say a last word as we were wrapping up that panel. And I looked out at the audience because I was personally frustrated with political parties at the time. And I looked out at the audience and I said, don't let political parties into municipal politics. And then we thought, we've got an idea for our next polling project. So, um, so if you've got ideas, to tweet at me. I'm always looking for great things to pull. People can find you on Twitter at Planet Janet YYC. Uh, Mayor, last word to you. Uh, we talked a little bit about what my focus was going to be as a new president, and it's definitely about relationships. And it, this is just a quick story that uh, I want to build that relationship with the provincial government and, of course, with all of the municipalities across Alberta. And while I was sitting here on your show, I got a message from Minister Grecian's Chief of Staff, Josh Billick who said to say hi to you. So I wanted to throw that in there and make sure that um, the people that I get to work with and for across Alberta municipalities know that those relationships that I want to form and and build is exactly what I'm doing. Awesome. Uh, yeah, we know that ministers and staff are watching the show. We appreciate it. That's why folks like you come on here. When you want to talk to decision makers, when you want to have them hear your message, You show up on Real Talk, and we sure appreciate your availability. That's the president of Alberta Municipalities, Tyler Gannam, and pollster, Janet Brown. We'll talk to you both again soon. Thanks Thanks very much, Ryan. Yeah, you got it. And you can check out more uh, by visiting their website, abmunis.ca. Let's check in live here on our unofficial, unscientific Twitter poll. Uh, Johnny, just give me a second here to refresh it. And so we'll see where we're at. We're, we're just about, we're, we're 35 minutes in. So we're see, we'll see where people are. There's still 23 and a half hours for you to vote on this. Uh, 352 votes on our poll. Would you like to see political parties represented at the municipal level in Alberta? 86% say no. Uh, No, this is unofficial and unscientific, meaning that somebody could be voting on this from the Philippines. Somebody could be voting on this from 10 different accounts. So take it for what it's worth. Uh, But kind of interesting to see. I mean, that is a resounding majority no vote at this point. Who knows if this is going to happen? Some folks believe that this could be a priority of the provincial government to, to, you know, essentially get more conservative councillors represented, to get more conservative representation on city councils, town councils across the province, and and for that matter, school boards as well. You can let us know what you think about this. If if you're more of a long-form thinker, you you don't want to just click on a Twitter poll, you'd rather send us an email, 
You can be in touch to talk at ryanjesperson.com or you can hit us up on any of our social media platforms, uh, TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter as well. This conversation was presented by our friends at Grand Dog Essentials Quality Raw Food. I was talking about those dogs running around our backyard. That's Moses and Monroe, our beloved pups who are eating Grand Dog Essentials Quality Raw Food twice a day. And they've been eating Grand Dog Essentials food for years, way before Real Talk even started, because we were recommended this company and we saw right away that there were immediate benefits from that raw diet. If you go to the Shop Now link at granddog.ca, you can check out their Four Leaf Rover bundles. You know, sometimes your pup or even your cat might need more than just food to achieve their optimum health if they're dealing with allergies or maybe joint pain if they're a senior dog that has their long list of challenges maybe they got a skin issue or immunity issues there are so many different curated bundles put together by the team at four leaf rover and you can have these delivered right to your door in calgary edmonton or central alberta along with the quality raw food All you have to do is go to granddog.ca. Don't forget, if this is your first time ordering, the promo code REALTALK takes 10% off your first time order. Hey, this is a shout out to the University of Alberta grads that are watching or listening to this episode. The U of A Alumni Awards recognizes the professional achievements, the community service, and the innovation of graduates around the globe. As one of the university's highest honors, these awards acknowledge and celebrate those who are not only excelling in their careers, but also making a profound difference in the lives of others. Because behind every successful graduate, there's a story of determination, innovation, and change. If you know an outstanding University of Alberta alum that's inspiring you, and they're looking for change makers, world shapers, or status quo breakers, they want to give them the recognition. You've got until December 15th to nominate someone in your life for a University of Alberta Alumni Award for 2024. It's easy to find. Just go to uab.ca slash nominate. That's uab.ca slash nominate. Are you right now navigating and stepping around piles of laundry on the floor in your bedroom? Do you have old DVDs you just can't throw out stacked up beside your TV for everybody to see when they come over to visit? Are you stepping on rakes and spare tires and recycling every time you step into your garage? It sounds like it might be time for a free design consultation with California Closets. They work in bedrooms, workspaces, living areas, storage rooms, and yeah, garages, the workhorse of the home, creating custom closet and storage solutions for customers across the province the consultation is free we've gone through it ourselves as a family and i can tell you the ideas they will come up with working with your budget We mentioned our social media channels and how you can find Real Talk RJ on X, you know, on Twitter, on Instagram and on TikTok. And I see a bunch of people, a few people in the chat saying that we should be on threads. Mm -hmm. I feel like threads was on my radar for like two days. Yeah, we're we're both on threads as as, you know, our personal accounts. We have like placeholder accounts. I I mean, I guess I guess we could start up a Real Talk one. But what we're seeing is that they they had this huge boom and the hype was all there for about a week. And now I just look today, daily active users down by 82 percent. Yeah, not a lot of traction there. But hey, if people want, we can throw our clips up there as well if if you guys are only on x i see some people commenting that they won't go back to the dreaded they're not going back to twitter yeah Yeah. you know they hate elon's forehead (laughs) the forehead (laughs) uh this isn't a sports show but we can't ignore that the uh, oh no well i just i just for five minutes i just want to this is what you you and i were talking about this all the way up until five seconds before the show started Mm. uh and then we had some serious business to get to on billions of dollars in funding and political parties and but mm-hmm. the Edmonton Oilers are now six games below 500. They're like almost 20 points behind Las Vegas in the standings, it's, and it's yeah. not even Remembrance Day yet. 
The team loses last night in Vancouver. The Canucks are 3-0 and against yeah. the Oilers this year, absolutely owning them. Coach, coach sets a, a record. Like, nobody's been thrown out. Uh, in the Oilers organization from a coaching standpoint since like 1986. <laughs> this is a big deal last night. Jay Woodcroft getting kicked out of the arena. I like that he got kicked out. Uh, he showed some passion. He's a, he's, a, he's a pretty steady Eddie guy, and I, yeah. I, I like seeing him get booted. I didn't love seeing mm-hmm. Leon Dreisaitl take a 10-minute misconduct, but no, the Canucks like have the but Oilers clearly number, frustration, man. right? Yeah. yeah, so I don't know what happens. They're heading into San Jose, who's off oh, to this is literally bad. the worst start in NHL history. Battle for the bottom of the barrel. Yeah, like, but- loser has to leave town after this one. Like the loser has to close the franchise, but uh, I don't. I don't know. This is bad. Like Oilers, forget the cup, Brian. Yeah. They're not going to make playoffs at yeah. this rate. I mean, like, I was reminding myself last night as I was watching the game, I was reminding myself that they've now played 11 games and there are 82 in a season. So they have 71 more games to play. It is far too soon, far too early to mm. stick a fork in the team. But they're creating a real problem for themselves. Like, for example, winning the division is probably out of reach. The problem is the But division. I wouldn't say missing playoffs is a guarantee. Not even close. What's, what's Vegas got? Vegas already has 23 points. They've got five. Well, they're, not, they're not slowing down. That Vegas is, is a wagon. That is a big gap to make up if you're, gonna, you're not going to win the division or if you even want to get into a wild card spot. It's really bad. And... I don't know. When they said cup or bust, Ryan, I didn't know they really meant... Bust. <laughs> we're going to... Either we're going to win the cup or we're not going to win any games. Was there a team <laughs> meeting that we missed about cup or bust? I don't yeah. know. I don't know. Hey, we put out the call to you, Real Talkers, you know, to send us an email to let us know your thoughts. And we always want to make sure at least once, probably twice a week, not including the flamethrower on Fridays presented by the DQs of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. I mean, that's a tradition. Your chance to get it off your chest, to bring the heat, uh, to, to air your beef, so to speak, with the flame thrower but also the longer form stuff and thoughts you have about what you're hearing on the show and i appreciated this from garth uh, garth said jespo i figured that you know you'd be discussing the the ucp the united conservative agm uh this week and before opinions and rhetoric start flying all over the place says garth uh, I'd like to present a nuanced perspective uh, from my experience as a black immigrant married to a black immigrant uh, with two children born in In Alberta's capital city. Uh, I have friends and colleagues with similar backgrounds and trust me, we've had extensive discussions about diversity, equity and inclusion. Uh, Now, sidebar here. This is Ryan talking now. You'll remember that of the resolutions passed, I think there were 29 of them at the AGM. One of them uh, included uh, basically removing EDI, equity, diversity, inclusion, removing EDI from the formula at universities. Uh, in the context of maybe who might be accepted or who might be hired. And we can get more into this in future episodes. It sounds to me like it would be good fodder for a roundtable. Back to Garth. So this is the context of what he's writing in on. Uh, He says, none of us want what EDI deeply represents. Garth says, the world sounds great, but what it has come to represent, or he said, pardon me, the words sound great, but what it has come to represent is disrespectful to those it claims to help. Garth says, I put in years of hard work for a company that entrusted me uh, and promoted me to a leadership position. Uh, Right now, I'd be very frustrated if my employer told me that my position, along with my fellow black colleagues, was an EDI move. We all work hard. And as immigrants, our values are based on hard work, which we hope to pass on to our children. Now, it's a fact that the majority of schools are run by progressive minded people these days, and it's challenging for me to understand why we need EDI unless we're willing to admit that our schools and institutions are inherently racist. Some people probably would say that, Garth, but I digress. He says, in that case, the focus should be on identifying and addressing the racists. We may never erase the history of slavery or black oppression, but we can move forward together in unity. Black and other non-white people have a lot of catching up to do. And in my view, hard and smart work is the key, not free passes. Garth says, when I moved here from Jamaica, my motto was and still is, I don't want to be treated better or worse than anybody else. And that's exactly how I'm raising my kids. He said, I hope you find this worth reading, and I'd appreciate your perspective on what I'm saying. 
Um, first of all, thank you for your email, Garth. I, I hesitate to share my perspective just because you come from uh, so much more of a learned uh, and life experience perspective on this than I do. But I don't know that I see EDI, uh, a commitment to EDI, as free passes. Um, it was interesting for us. You remember when we talked to Jackie Ray Greening, who's the program director at a bunch of radio stations in Edmonton, and they, they were launching that new sports show, that AM sports show after TSN closed its doors. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, one of their sportscasters, one of their star broadcasters had made a comment uh, when asked why there were no women hosts when they launched their station. He mm -hmm. said, I really don't think it matters. Mm -hmm. And the comment obviously exploded. And so we brought on that broadcaster, Jason Greger's boss, Jackie Ray Greening, to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And she shot straight through that interview. And she said, I asked her, I, I said, in, when it comes to promoting women or other minorities, and if you want to hear the full interview, I recommend you go back and check it out. It's not too far ago. Within the last two months in our archives, I think we asked, why aren't there more women in broadcasting? I think that's the name of the episode. She says, I have always and I will always hire on merit. Uh, and she indicated to us somewhat um, fearlessly, I think, considering the circumstance, that that was not something that factored in. The mm -hmm. diversity was not something that factored into her building a radio roster. I was a little surprised when she said it, but I also appreciated her honesty. Sure. Um, she talked to us a lot about what it was like for her coming up in the business as a woman. Uh, we also talked to TSN's uh, star out of the Ottawa Bureau, Claire Hanna, on that episode that was well worth your time. So I don't think that free passes is the way to look at it, but I do think that there's huge value in having EDI as a priority in your company and being aware of the fact that many groups, including women and people of color, um, and for that matter, LGBTQ community and others, um, uh, uh, folks that are living with disabilities, for example, um, have been excluded. Mm -hmm. um, uh, not just hired in the first place, not promoted, sure. um, and, and the like. And I do think that it's important to have that on your radar for many different reasons. About a year ago, we did a show. Um, <laughs> I'll be honest, I can't remember the guest's name, but she was a researcher, and she talked about how you can make a corporate case, you can make a bottom line business case, in other words, a dollar and cents case, she said it is justifiable for a business to prioritize EDI. In other sure. words, you're not making sacrifices. You're not no. cutting corners. You're not holding the company back. Uh, she said it is worth the investment. And I thought mm -hmm. that that was a really interesting conversation. More ideas, more people, more uh, more backgrounds. That's always better. And also, I, I remember that show and I remember her saying, OK, you're hiring the best person for the job. But there's a number of reasons that somebody may be way more qualified than someone else. Number one, financially. Right. And, and there's a lot of people who come from diverse backgrounds who don't have the opportunities that other people do to go to school, to find the education, whether it's radio or whatever you're talking about. So I did agree with her point. But at the same time, I was like, well, you know, maybe those people are more qualified because they had a bet, you know. They had a leg up, which yeah. is which is another reason to get those people who may not have had, you know, the luck or the, the, the family or the money or the friends or the doors open. But they still have the drive. They still have creativity. They still have talent. They still have a willingness to to, to be successful and to make your company successful. So I, if I walk into a room now, especially like this building, I love Mercer. Like all sorts of different people, different races, different genders, different ages, all working under one roof for all different companies. And when we when we meet out there in the lounge and have coffee, it's all different ideas. It's not just like me and you grumpy in the corner talking about the others. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to you know say, I, I was gonna say we're never grumpy, that. and then you brought up the Oilers, and I thought, well, maybe sometimes we're, we're grumpy. Yeah, maybe we sometimes were, we're a little bit we're a little bit grumpy. Um, uh, you you made a comment uh, last week that I thought was kind of funny. You, you, you were, we were talking with our top forty roundtable on Friday. If you missed that, um, Edify, our good friends at Edify, have their uh, new top forty, the twenty twenty three top forty under forty list out. We've uh, we're all really excited about the event coming up on November twenty eighth at the Windspear Center. You can join us uh, and you can check out the list. Uh, at edifyedmonton.com. Look at that. There's that young whippersnapper, Edmonton counselor Andrew what a Knack. Good looking. I saw Knack's tweet, by the I way, when he, when he announced uh, that, he, that he was listed on the uh, top 40. Um, so is Janice Irwin, the MLA, by the way, for the NDP. But, but Knack said, uh, perhaps even more surprising than me being on this list is the fact that I am indeed under 40 years of age, said Knack, joking around, the veteran counselor. <laughs> um, I ran into him over the weekend. What is he saying? He looks old? Yeah, I think he's saying okay, he looks okay, old. Well, okay. he's, he's just been around for a while. That's all. I don't think he looks old. And if you see him in person, he definitely doesn't look old. But but uh, I, I, he and I had a beer 
last week at an event and and uh i said i said i, I will be honest we were laughing i said i'll be honest i thought you were a little over 40 <laughs> <laughs> and he says to me he get he says the list is out four days before his 40th oh, birthday. Man. So he just squeaked in. He just squeaked in four days before. But we were talking in this top 40 roundtable on Friday. People can check it out. And it's not just us scratching people's backs and talking about how great they are. We had three young uh, but incredibly accomplished business leaders mm-hmm. and community leaders in studio talking about working with Gen Z and trends on back to work orders and and basically the future of the workplace. And it was great. And you made a comment about knowing people. <laughs> what did you say that have slid in ass first into CEO roles? And it kind of I believe the uh, the term was fell ass backwards, fell into ass backwards yeah. positions of power or, you know, like I just know people like. I, I don't want to mention any names. I know people in this city who are running companies, running businesses, running restaurants. Oh, give us one name, John. Give us one name. Okay, his name is David. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> that was a random name. Though. But like, you know, they, they got there because their dad knows a guy or or they have a friend who, who bought into the business or, uh, you know, they worked with someone who was at the ground floor when, when the building was being built or... Uh, you know, a family friend or whatever owes them. Like, there's a there's a million reasons why somebody can be a CEO, and especially these days. Like, <laughs> I'm not going to get into. It. Oh, you're but speaking all, so carefully. All I'm going to say is you're that so, this is so unlike if, you. If somebody from Gen X, Gen Z, even a millennial, can work the system and get into a position of of financial freedom before anyone else. I, I don't think it's tricky or, or shady. I think it's smart. A friend of mine is in a, a position, a very high profile job. Um, I'm not going to say the industry, but he 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 is um, he's in line to be one of the next promoted to one of the highest callings, mm. one of the highest profession. Oh, I'll just say that. That's not who cares. I'll say that he, he, he's in line to become a judge. Um, and he's had a very high profile job for a long time. He is very well respected and recognized in his career. Uh, but he was talking to me about how the bench has not reflected the population. Oh, and, um, and he was very honest with me about talking about how his personal career path, um, may look a little bit different than he had originally anticipated or hoped because there's some catching up to do in getting the bench to reflect the population. And the bench is one example of a million. Mm-hmm. City council should reflect the, the population. A roster of teachers at a school should reflect the population. 100%. Like, like, and you could list a hundred more things. Mm-hmm. CEOs, the top 40 list. I mean, every, you know, we want that to reflect mm-hmm. the population for obvious reasons. And so when it doesn't, then there's some catching up to do, mm-hmm. right? Which means that women and people of color and indigenous professionals and all, all these other you know people living with disabilities, I mean, we can make a long list here, should be considered more seriously or more frequently than people like you and me, John. Now, what does that mean? To be candid and casual and a little bit funny. Oh, you mean white? It means guys like <laughs> us, younger white guys are, are screwed, uh, but not really mm. because... White guys have not been screwed for basically recorded human history. I know. And so when you have an honest conversation, uh, if your friend group is diverse enough to, to have a challenging conversation where people are talking about their own lived experience, it's a very valuable conversation to have because you understand the uphill climb swimming against the stream that so many people have had for so long. Mm. And there's no way to justify that to be the case. And uh, yeah, it's not a self-deprecate. It's not like a woe is me. Like uh, people are always like, well, why are white men always beating up on themselves? We're not beating up on themselves. I can be honest and say that like, you know, I've fallen ass backwards into them. Some things I've had a little more luck than the average person. And yes, it's probably because I'm a guy. It's called privilege. And, and I'm white. Right. And I'm, you right. know, I'm, I'm the, I've always said this to my wife. I said, I'm very lucky because my wife is this beautiful Indian woman. And I'm like, the average of everything. I'm average height, average weight, <laughs> average looks, average into, like everything. I'm just level across Above the board. Above average producer. But I'm saying for someone like me to be successful like this, and I'm just some average person, right? There are people out there who are different, who are diverse, who are who are of different color, different genders, who are smarter than me, more talented than me, than me and they deserve a better chance than I do to get into positions like I have. Yeah, that's no what I'm kidding. saying. Love it. Um, you let us know what you think about this. Uh, you know, sometimes we're, you know, this is 
we don't plan to have this conversation, but Garth sent us that email and it really got me thinking and I appreciate it. I mean, on the flip side, like Garth does make that good point as well. When if, if you're at a company and you know that that company is is taking a responsible and positive step forward and and saying like EDI is a priority to us and then you're a black man like Garth, you don't want your colleagues like he wrote it in his own words. I just read his email. He doesn't want his colleagues thinking that he's a a quote unquote diversity hire. He doesn't want that. He's he's earned his way there. He's a talented professional. He deserves to be there. So if this is speaking to you, if you have lived experience in this regard, we'd love to hear from you. You can push our conversation forward. Um, this isn't an ad that I'm reading here. This is just something that we're really proud to support. And I wanted to put this on your radar, friends. You know that Saturday coming up is Remembrance Day, uh, November 11th. And uh, our friends at the Juno Beach Center Association have launched a fundraiser. And, and I'm hoping that, you know, Real Talk has made a commitment to this. And I'm hoping that you can join us in this. Um, the Juno Beach Center, you're probably familiar with this, is is basically a way, and it's a facility, it's an actual brick and mortar facility as well, uh, to recognize the sacrifices made by Canadian servicemen and women in World War II. Uh, you can learn more at junobeach.org. Uh, now, they've set a goal. It's a very attainable goal. Uh, this, so this is Canada's second World War Museum. It's a cultural center that's, that's located in Normandy, France, which is obviously an area of great significance. Uh, when it comes to world history, when it comes to Canadian involvement in World War II, when it comes to uh, the sacrifice made by women and uh, men in, in World War II, and they're looking to raise ten grand, which is something I think we can do pretty quick. And uh, you go to junobeach.org. There is a Giving Tuesday initiative that's coming up on November 28th, and we'll, we'll talk to you more about that on the 28th of November. But ahead of that, it just seemed timely to me, uh, coming up to Remembrance Day, coming up to November 11th, if, if you want to do something to show your appreciation, you can check out their uh, their fundraising goal, again, at junobeach.org. And John, there's a, there's a really neat um, initiative that they have going on right now, which is like a flag sponsorship, basically. It's called Flags for Juno. Hmm. And um, here's the deal. Now, I know that a $500 donation is, is like not necessarily doable for everybody but if you donate a minimum of five hundred dollars you're going to qualify for the flags for juno 80 effort okay this uh the flags for juno 80 effort if you donate a minimum of five hundred dollars they're going to send you a flag a canadian flag that has actually flown at the juno beach center in normandy france wow so the flag has flown in Normandy at the Juno Beach Center. It comes with a certificate of authenticity. Ooh. It's a big deal. So uh, real talk, uh, just as of this morning, we've made a $500 commitment. We're going to display this Canadian flag in our studio. You can get it all boxed up and, and properly packaged mm -hmm. uh, if you choose with the certificate of authenticity. But this is just a way uh, to say thank you to our Canadian veterans and to ensure that this center will continue um, to look like it should, to operate like it should, as we pay homage to the 45,000 Canadians who lost their lives during the war, 5,500 of those Canadians killed during the Battle of Normandy, 381 killed on D-Day. This center was opened about 20 years ago by veterans and volunteers with a vision to create a permanent memorial to all Canadians who served in World War II, and they're looking to preserve that legacy for future generations through mm. education and remembrance. So if you're able, I encourage you to uh, join us in supporting that Flags for Juno 80 effort at junobeach.org. And, and listen, if you're if you're more along the lines of a 5 or 10 or $20 donation, that's cool too. I mean, that that is a way that you can show your appreciation uh, leading up to or on Remembrance Day, and, and we'll give you a couple of more reminders of this in the weeks to come. I think about that, those numbers, uh, 5,500 people killed during the Battle of Normandy. Canadians, That's I mean. crazy. 45,000 Canadians mm -hmm. uh, lost their lives during that war, uh, as we remember. I'm also just recognizing at this very moment, the show is called Real Talk. My poppy's on my coat, not on my sweatshirt, which I means just I've done the entire so show I, without I a poppy. I wear it on my coat. I do have a poppy on my coat. All the time. And then we're supposed to put it on during the show. We oh have God. our poppies. We we're, do have our poppies. And we, we are taking poppies. Monday off, just yeah. so people know that. Uh, yeah, we will uh, We will be uh, observing the stat on Monday, which means there will be no episode of Real Talk coming up on uh, this coming Monday. Mm -hmm. But of course, we'll be back live on Tuesday. This conversation, this show does not happen without uh, partners of ours like our friends. 
friends at Friesen Brothers who want to remind you that for a very limited time at their South Edmonton, that's the Rabbit Hill store, the Stony Plains store, or the Fort Saskatchewan store. Those are the three that have the Friesen Brothers rooftop honey. I love this. The Rabbit Hill rooftop honey. They keep bees on the roof of their Edmonton grocery store. I think that's one of the many reasons why they won that gold medal uh, from the Canadian Federation of Independent Grocers this year as literally the best grocery store in Canada. That's the one in Edmonton on Rabbit Hill Road. So they keep bees up there. They harvest the honey and then they make it available to Friesen customers. If you're a Friesen Brothers regular, you may have already got your hands on a jar. It's a very limited run for obvious reasons. It went on sale November 1st, which means it's going to sell out soon you can find out more details at freezen.com that's f-r-e-s-o-n.com or you can just go see them in store in fort saskatchewan stony plain or south edmonton on rabbit hill road coming up on tomorrow's show we're going to check in with filmmaker nizreen baker she's in town for a film festival and we're going to be taking a look at the arab world we're going to take a look at culture and conflict We're going to get some insight into obviously what's happening right now in Israel and Gaza, but we'll broaden our focus from there. Plus, more of your emails on the politics and news happening all around us. After all, you are the most engaged talk audience in Canada, and we thank you for that.